Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me in the back there? Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that really warm and generous introduction. As Omar says, no pressure, right? I just have to live up to all of that. This is that book that he was referring to, the compilation between myself and Carl Pope. And Carl's cover says, is America the America we learned to imagine? I think that's going to be part of my question tonight. I really want to say before I begin that it's such an honor, well, in a minute, it's such an honor to be invited to speak in this lecture series. And one's always supposed to say that. But in this case, it's actually true. It's humbling to be in the front of a list. I mean, the people they brought for you this semester, it's astonishing. Now, really, I hope, you know, it's so great to see people come on a cold Tuesday night in the rain. Thank you so much for doing that. Come back for everybody else, because like, I'm just like the warm-up act for an amazing, amazing semester. So um, with that, I'm going to start. Um, this is a slightly intimidating space, and I'm supposed to stand still so that, um, so that they can video. So normally I like to kind of walk around and chat, but in this space I'm actually going to read something. Uh, so I, I hope it will energize, nonetheless, despite being somewhat formal in that particular regard. So this is a project that I'm beginning that comes off the book around Black Lives Matter, which forced me to do this work that I'm starting to do now, which is work that I have not really wanted to do about whiteness and its infrastructures. Because today, from Brexit to Bolsonaro, from the wall to the detention center, it is again apparent that racialization is at once a material process of division and segregation. It's a system of violent domination and the production of vulnerability to harm across a specific dividing line, what Du Bois called the color line, but also now material boundaries. So my questions are, by what infrastructures has white supremacy sustained itself to reappear in such force? So by way of approaching this, let's begin by acknowledging that the present is a moment of transformation really unequaled in 50 years. We are living in a world now in which both material infrastructures and mediated identities are in shift. As you can see from these statistics, we live in a world that's urban, young, networked, and in both financial and environmental crisis. Unemployment and alienation are systemic. Services are increasingly marked by their absence on the global scale. So these are the kind of issues, when I say infrastructure, that I mean. That with 54% of the population living in cities for the first time in history, most of that growth has been in so-called informal settlements, which already shelter 25% of the world's population. Most of those people are under 30. At the moment of neoliberalism's beginning, back in the 1970s, Stuart Holm declared, and I quote, when a conjuncture unrolls, there's no going back. History shifts gears. The terrain changes. You are in a new moment. And here we are again, in another such moment. Now, at that time, Hall's formula for his thesis at that time was Marx plus Fanon, which I want to reverse now to say Fanon plus Marx. For us then, Fanon here stands for the politics of decolonization, from the territorial acknowledgement of indigenous claims, and we should remember always that we are on stolen land as we do these presentations, Lenape land, to Palestine and South Africa's fallism. And fallism gives us a simple slogan, all must fall. Patriarchy must fall, racialization must fall, homophobia must fall. Marx in this formula then stands for the circulation of socially mediated capital in the era of biopolitical production, which is a mouthful. But what it means is in Michael Hart's terms, the production of ideas, images, languages, code, affects, and social relationships. Now that's at one level simply understood by social media. But more broadly, I would say it's infrastructure. In this framework, 
the contestation of the infrastructures of white supremacy, as materialized by statues and monuments, has extended from Southern Africa to North America and forms now what Hall called one of the limit cases of the present. So this racializing assemblage will be articulated here with both the infrastructures of segregation and detention and the mediated decolonial forms of Gaza's great march of return that's ongoing in Palestine through professional and vernacular photos. So I want to begin by thinking about where we can do this kind of work. And I'm going to appropriate Hannah Arendt's evocative phrase, the space of appearance, to describe both the segregated space delineated by white supremacy as public and to counter claims to appearance. But I'm going to use it in a very different way. Arendt described this space as that which occurs, quote, whenever men are together in the manner of speech and action. And her imagination was the democracy of the ancient Greek city-state, or polis, which was founded, as she herself attests, on the exclusion of women, children, non-Greeks, and enslaved human beings. So by the time everyone is left out, only about 3 or 4% of the population was part of this so-called democracy. It was more exactly a space of representation, because only those admitted were those who represented the title of free male citizens. So understood in this way, Arendt's space of appearance was itself the infrastructure of white supremacy. In South Africa, under apartheid, that appearance was key to the possibilities of life. And I'm showing you here a graphic that's on the wall of the apartheid museum in Johannesburg. So you can see from this how appearance is literally the way in which those appearing as white can access certain spaces that others cannot, always subject to revision. Now, this kind of appearance is what I want to call optical. It's always subject to surveillance and control. It's everything from the judging gaze of the police officer as to who counts as white and who may be considered black, to the scan of a passport at a border, or the taking of fingerprints to register an asylum claim the saturation surveillance of everyday life by CCTV, the drone feed that enables remote killing, swipe left, swipe right, all the way to the facial recognition software that opens your phone and tells all the big five information companies exactly where you are. There is, however, another appearance, that it's not representation, either in the political or the cultural sense. It's the very possibility of appearing directly. In this non-enclosed encounter that prefigures an outside to coloniality, I see you and you see me, and the look that passes between us is not singular, cannot be owned, it's common. It's an apprehension of the claim of the other to the right to look. And that look is exchanged in friendship, solidarity, and in love. I do not speak in that moment. I wait, I listen, even and especially if you do not talk. We do not and cannot enter the space equally because history and ancestry cannot be abolished. To appear here is not optical. It's the combination of the embodied mediation of appearance, an awareness of time that respects the ancestors and remembers the future, an engagement with the land on which the appearance takes place, and a commitment to the reciprocity and consent of that appearance. So what does that look like? It's a poem by the Oglala Sioux poet Lely Long Soldier, which in my mind represents the form of this encounter. It's in her 2017 collection, Whereas, which I recommend to you in the strongest possible terms. Her title is a response to the 2009 Congressional Resolution of Apology to Native Americans in which the apology was framed within the whereas preamble, which, if you know your Robert's Rules of Order, means that it has no legal value. So early on, Long Soldier visualizes the space of appearance. And I'm going to read the poem, as it were, from the top. The space in which to place me, the space in me you see, is this space. 
To see this space, see how you place me in you. This is how to place you in the space in which to see. So here, I, the reader, am the you of her poem, the non-indigenous settler, who may, with due process, become able to access the space in which to see. The key to the poem, then, is the space of appearance in the middle of the page, formed by the unequal ways of seeing. Now, Long Soldier has many other words in her collection for that unreadable, but perceivable and knowable space that rhymes without sound. It is at once for her, quote, American Indian emptiness. And the white space she uses in forming this poem, which results in letterpress when you use two or more spaces, whether by accident or design. So it's also important to know that against many counter-hegemonic efforts, this space cannot be a commons, even if it is briefly common, because it was indigenous land first. As it was said at Standing Rock, we don't own the land, the land owns us. Indigenous peoples claim the land, but not in the sense of individual parcels or plots of land. Now, in the white gaze of Western eyes, that makes no sense. This movement away from segregation is the breaking through that produces the capacity to decolonize. And I'm adapting capacity here from Jisbir Pu'ar to mean the possibility of embodied engagement in disregard for socially produced disability, counterinsurgency generated debility, and the pharmacopornographic control of the affects of colonization, which is to say anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. That capacity then is not a steroidal form of masculinized resistance. It's what I call decolonial love. It works by means of what Chela Sandoval has called a breaking through whatever controls. This sense of love as movement that undoes control draws on the long decolonial revolutionary tradition from the Haitian Revolution to Che Guevara and even Franz Fanon, who says, quote, today I believe in the possibility of love. That is why I endeavor to trace its imperfections, its perversions. So this love is not as it were, an alternative, a softer one to direct action, but it's a movement past and beyond control, past and through walls, checkpoints, swipe card entry, and all the apparatus of social control. The infrastructure of whiteness is what Fanon then describes as, quote, a world compartmentalized, Manichaean, immobile, a world of statues. It produces optical distinction, good or evil, free or enslaved, citizen or migrant. This hierarchical domination is, un is incarnated by the statue of the colonist on a pedestal here, Cecil John Rhodes. The memorializing statue is not, for Fanon, a metaphor. For in racial theory, statues are flesh and mind part of the global infrastructure of white supremacy and the production of segregated urban space from colonial Mexico to the Upper West Side. These racializing assemblages articulate colonial race theory, history as colonial destiny, and the exploitation of labor within what Fanon called the aesthetic of respect for the established order. Now there's a whole history in the form, the form of the colonial statute. The statue materializes the imagined surveillance of the overseer on the plantation you see here in a print from 1667. He's the surrogate here of the sovereign posed with his cane. And you can see that in this portrait of Charles I by Van Dyck. When you fuse those two things together, the two make Leviathan, the image of the colonial state from Thomas Hobbes visualized here as a sea monster dominating a colonial island. If you look very closely, you can see ships in the water on the right-hand side of the print. This is visibly a colonial settlement. And this then becomes visual cliche in the modern period, incarnated as part of the unnoticed established order as the war memorial 
and the Confederate statue. The statue is also a state of mind. Fanon studied as a psychiatrist with the French doctor Francois Tuskel, and this is a picture of him, who formed his concept of the non-homogeneity of the self during the Spanish Revolution and Civil War of 1936 to 39. For Tosquel, quote, the personality doesn't consist of a block. If it did, it would be a statue, end of quote. So the white mind is that statue and vice versa. Alternatively, in Tosquel's view, when the collective that each person is can engage in a collective activity no longer constrained by the hierarchies and segregation of capitalist monohumanism, the result is less mental trauma. So this is to say that against Freud's view, where shell shock and the death drive amongst conscripted soldiers of World War I, where you know, they were subjected to endless bombardments and forced to risk their lives pointlessly, producing endless trauma and hysteria of various kinds. Against that, if you can activate yourself within a collective context, you can reduce the possibility of healing. So whiteness is then a singular self that's produced by segregation within the optical space of appearance. Outside its boundaries, it imagines a savage world to be kept out. The struggle to remain singular produces alienation. It manifests equally as grief or the inability to feel, immobility or restlessness, but never equilibrium. But librium and lithium, yes, an entire chemical cosmography devoted to maintaining mono monocultural monohumans. So how can that night be transfigured? Asked the Ghanaian filmmaker John Acompra in his 2015 two-screen moving image with sound installation of that title that I saw myself in the new museum this summer. Hope some of you were able to see that too. In this disjuncture, in the break and in the wake, the voice of Kwame Nkrumah comes. We face neither east nor west, we face forward. We the decolonized was his formula in that betrayed beginning of the spirit of Bandung in 1958. To face forward is a positioning against racial capitalism, a setting of direction toward the dismantling of his infrastructures. And then Nkrumah's voice comes again, reminding his listeners that they are free, but they're not, and he knows it, and so do they. He's asking them to remember the future, that time when there will have been what he called the total liberation of Africa, when those infrastructures are erased. Ford is then at once a direction towards the collective possession of the self, which is what freedom has meant in the Atlantic world, the formation of a communal sense of being decolonized, and a relation to time. It's neither the progress touted by white liberalism nor the revanchism of the current reaction, but a cosmology that relates the human and the non-human over the span of many lives. Now that time is not yet. On the screens now in a complex installation Monuments, Lincoln, Washington, visited by the heads of decolonized states in technical archive footage that remembered brightness of past possibility and betrayal. Transfigured into the blue steeled glass of the corporate present. Figures still face forward at dawn's starry light, but Washington's liberty and Lincoln's emancipation are no more present than Nkrumah's decolonization, specters all. But specters return. They are the future. They remember it. So I will not treat whiteness as a monolithic form, opposed equally to all forms of alterity. I want to suggest that it's fissured, it's fractured, it's fragmented. It's always trying to form a statue. What I'm trying to do is to work in the cracks of whiteness in the manner suggested by John Holloway in relation to anti-capitalism. There are then many whitenesses, even if it presents to its others, as both material segregation by means of walls and as an impermeable structure of feeling. The work of anti-anti-blackness, if whiteness is anti-blackness, we are then anti-anti-blackness, 
is to be a transfiguring, to borrow a complex term, where I am trying to figure out how to get across in the nonlinear space of refusal and opposition. Disalienation means to decolonize the body, where this body, mine, is the product of three failed empires, the Russian, Ottoman, and British, and now articulated by US imperialism itself, obviously on the verge of failure. From these multiple failures, what is the ground to transform the self, myself, into something more capacious? Akantha calls it metamorphosis, a way to get to beginning. And so here I'm gonna make one screen for white supremacy, one for British colonial legacy, and one for Palestine, where my father grew up, which remembers the future. These are what Tosqueles called the juxtaposed pieces with paradoxical unions and disunions that form whiteness, what it has become for me. It is not universal. It is against the universal and the singular, but it seeks to face forward. So this is the first scene in Charlottesville. You'll remember, of course, that from Rwanda to London, from Cape Town to Charlottesville. Global cities are networked in the world of statues, coloniality. For the defenders of monuments from white liberals to their more overtly racist counterparts, to remove a statue is to erase history. At the public performance of white supremacy at Charlottesville, Manchus chanted, white lives matter. But not all those appearing white matter to the revived supremacists. They subscribe to the theory of separate species or types of human being as a hierarchy of the human, created in the aftermath of the Haitian Revolution when museums were first established. So in his study of human nature, published in 1801, this man, the French naturalist Julien Joseph Viret, discerned three distinct human species. And in this highly influential illustration, he depicts the orangutan on the lowest level, below the African, all topped by a version of the classical sculpture known as the Apollo Belvedere. This is then the white form. Despite Haiti, Viret declared that other than Europeans, there was nothing but, quote, a vile rabble of barbarians. Hence, world empire is European destiny. So these notions were imported wholesale into the United States by two then very famous folks called Josiah Knott and George Glidden, who published a book called Types of Man in 1854, a bestseller of white supremacy for its claim that many primitive types of mankind were created. And again, you see, it depends on the statue being the epitome of whiteness. So it was logical at the second International Eugenics Conference held at the American Museum of Natural History in 1921 in New York that to show the idealized white Nordic figure as a statue. Now, all of these racist stereotypes continue to walk the earth. This is a form of whiteness called Nordic whiteness. It excludes, on the one hand, Eastern whiteness, such as Poles, who are now hated in the UK as Brexit revives white supremacy. It also excludes Jews, and there is now a palpable new form of anti-Semitism. And at the same time, it excludes Southern Europeans from Italy, Greece, Spain, and so on. And the European Union has done its best to make them feel like second-class citizens over the past decade. Now, Nordic whiteness is now being sustained by some of the most hostile conditions for migrants anywhere. Once liberal Denmark, has designated areas lived in by so-called non-European immigrants as legally ghettos. That's the word they actually use. Children must take 25 hours of Danish cultural values, including Christianity and eating pork products. Criminal offenses in the ghetto get double the penalty of those committed elsewhere. And migrants who are seeking asylum, as is their right, are sequestered in camps administered by prison staff, as here, a camp called Schalsmark. I was shown around by some refugees uh, a few weeks ago. The asylum seekers describe conditions here as torture. Now, it's important to note this is not the torture of physical pain, but of persistent sensory deprivation. 
As you can see, refugees live behind fences, watched over by prison guards in former military barracks. No furniture is allowed in their living spaces, as here. No floor covering, no wall decoration, no radio, no TV, no internet. No playing on the grass because it's behind 10-foot fences. No school because the Red Cross runs the school for all age groups as a kindergarten, with coloring as the only activity. More than 100 children of all ages live here. No cooking is allowed, although the food provided is described as inedible, and it's anyway full of pork. And so this is a clandestine toaster oven that the people showing me around said will be confiscated at the next inspection, which takes place every week. If you look at the official website for Denmark, which there is one, it's rather extraordinarily, it announces that, quote, once we were brutal Vikings, meaning Nordic whites. No mention anywhere on that front page of immigration or Danish people of color, the Danish empire, and so on. At the Danish National Museum, a packed Viking exhibit on the first floor contrasts with the endless cases of colonial plunder upstairs, sitting in quiet, dust-gathering silence. The detention center itself is then, I would argue, a statue of segregation by statute. Like the museum, it separates the multiple deviant forms of humanity from the descendants of Vikings. These operations of segregation are, of course, as we know, equally active in the United States. So the very same skull collection that was used by Knott and Glidden to make their racist hierarchy is still in use at the University of Pennsylvania, including these skulls, which are those of enslaved Africans who died on the Middle Passage. They have these on public display and on their website. A 5,000 item collection of human remains is the most consulted collection at the American Museum of Natural History, including these skulls of over Herero and Nama people killed in the German genocide in 1904 to eight, overwritten now with the names of their purchasers, kept in cardboard boxes in an Upper West Side basement. So this purchase, some $500,000 in today's terms, was financed by the banker Felix Warburg, who was a trustee and department head at the museum. Now, all of this activity was and is motivated by the eugenic racism of the museum, signaled by its hosting of that 1921 International Congress. And the toxic proceedings of that Congress were later cited by Fanon in his famous chapter on the lived experience of the black as hallmark evidence of white supremacy. All of these human remains are the grounds on which the traditional authorities in Namibia are suing the German government for genocide in New York federal court, and we're waiting on the court's decision on that. So the museum is literally a mausoleum. It is a place in which the hierarchy of the races is not just theoretically, but literally incarnated in physical form. All the latent and manifest meanings of the world of statues as racializing assemblage played out at Charlottesville in 2017, where the, the white nationalists gathered to defend the statue of Robert E. Lee in numbers that have not been seen before or indeed since. Marchers famously chanted, Jews will not replace us. And this fascist slogan expresses the racist worldview in which true whiteness is always minoritarian. If Nordic whites, as signified by the statue, were to be replaced, the next group would rise up, that would be Jews. So-called race science held that next to the Teutonic, and I'm quoting here, the Jewish spirit is the chief motive force of Western civilization, end of quote. So note here two things. Note the threat that the Jews imp imply, but also that the very concept of modern Western civilization is central to race science as such. Jews were particularly important to the theory because they're held to exemplify the persistence of racial character and so on. It's a commonplace of such theories that Jews dominate the media. And it won't be surprising then to see why Trump endlessly attacks them. Trumpism's paradoxical investment in Jewish settler colonialism in Palestine is actually part of its racial nationalism. That is to say, if you have all the Jews live in Israel, so all the whites can live in the United States, where they now claim to be indigenous in world forgetting of the Menachem people 
who are actually indigenous to what is now Charlottesville. So if we switch scenes away from this to South Africa and think for a moment about Rhodes Must Fall. In her 2014 memoir of a born free, which is the generation born after the fall of legalized apartheid in South Africa, the activist Malaika Wa'azania saw that nothing has changed. She writes, the South Africa we see today is but a different version of yesterday's South Africa. Racialism and racism are no longer imposed through violence. They're now institutionalized, end quote. So she's raised in the Meadowlands informal housing west of Johannesburg, self-styled poor working class African. But Malaika gained admission to Stellenbosch University in the Western Cape. And arriving on campus in January of 2010, she encountered an Africana-dominated locale for the first time. And she writes, I first felt the magnitude of the contempt the Africanas have for us, a contempt that can be expressed in as minute a gesture as a glance. At once, she dropped out. And the campus of Stellenbosch University continues to exude colonial domination. I'm showing you here a statue of the university's founder, Jean Marais, an Africana nationalist, mining magnate, who dominates its central square. And yet, white nationalists and art historians alike have resisted calls for its removal. As we know, in 2015, a group of activists at Cape Town University took action against the statue of Cecil John Rhodes. And Rhodes was a notorious racist and imperialist. He created a civil service in South Africa on the model of the British Empire, which is also actually still in use in New York City. The first protest was carefully organized by a group of students and carried out by Chumani Maxwelli on March 9th, 2015. In Fanon's footsteps, Maxwelli attributed his decision to act to, quote, a nervous condition which drives me mad and others to either go mad or to commit suicide. And just this summer, actually, a dean at uh, UCT did, in fact, commit suicide in July. So Maxwell's 2015 protest, you can see here, consists of throwing human waste at the statue. And he brought that waste from the township of Kayalicha, where he lives, which is a bringing of the world of the dispossessed into and onto the world of statues. Kailicha has a fast-growing population of 1 million, 99% African. And there, people, predominantly 75% of people, share chemical toilets supplied by a private company, as you can see here. Often broken and unsanitary, access to even these facilities can be dangerous, so people collect waste inside their own space, providing Max Whaley with the raw materials for his action. And he considered that action to be about, quote, human dignity for the black people living in shacks, as much or more than it was about the university. The road statue articulates the present world of statues, linking infrastructural and educational inequality to the legacies of colonial hierarchy. And as you know, Rosemans Fall rapidly gained momentum, leading to the permanent removal of the statue, only about a month after the first action. Its removal created a tabula rasa, to use Fanon's terms. This is where it is now. And there's a black sweep of history down the colonial steps of UCT's campus. But as the Rose Must Fall Collective put it, the removal was only the beginning of decolonization. The statue articulated the infrastructure of white supremacy, and so its fall requires thinking about all forms of infrastructure. And just this past summer, two South African school children drowned in open pit toilets, which is a kind of latrine that's dug in the ground. One in four schools in the Eastern Cape have only pit toilets. 61 schools have no toilet at all. 4,500 schools across South Africa use only pit toilets, and it will take 19 years to fulfill the current government's promise to get rid of them at the current pace. So Rosemans Fall was an intersectional movement, and it was opposed to a racist and patriarchal society, in their terms, that has remained unchanged since the end of formal apartheid. Much of that work remains to be done. In 2016, an exhibition opening at the University of Cape Town of Rosemans Fall photographs was the subject of an intervention by a group called the Trans Collective. 
they blocked the way into the show so that, in their words, anyone who would enter the blockaded doors to see the exhibition would be stepping over trans bodies. Inside, collective members wrote rapist in red paint on a photograph of Max Whaley throwing waste, just like the one I showed you a moment or two ago. But the action was not at all well received. And you can see here, this is the curator of the show, baffled by the way the trans person here is writing rapist on that photograph. Journalistic accounts subsequently described them as smearing paint rather than writing on the glass, and the words are clearly legible. And the mostly white South African art world has united against what they saw as censorship rather than institutional liberation, let alone decolonial imagining. And the impasse that has persisted since indicates that decolon decolonizing visuality doesn't happen just by taking down a statue, just by creating tabula rasa. Something else has to take its place. So to think about that, to conclude, I'm going to just begin by thinking about what's happening right now in Gaza. This is a photograph that I took a couple of years ago of the fence that separates Gaza from Israel, so-called. And as you can see, it's not exactly a picket fence. It's, as you saw, it's Shah's mark. It's a solid steel security fence with razor wire all over it. Now, Gaza does not really register with global elites. To use the economist Sarah Roy's term, Gaza has been de-developed into an entirely carceral zone by means of checkpoints, mass incarceration, and 95% undrinkable water. Gaza demonstrates the lived experience of the dispossessed, the global majority, the potentially revolutionary. They're young, they're precariously networked, suffering failed infrastructure, and subject to psycho counterinsurgency. There's no freedom of entry or exit. Castle and colonialism here is castle capitalism. Traditionally, cities were the hardest place to do counterinsurgency because it's easy for people to hide and escape and so on. But like the Danish detention center, the occupation now wages mental war by physical means. So one Israeli soldier described their tactics as, quote, deter them, scare them, wear them down psychologically. The United Nations has concluded that the goal is to produce what it calls hopelessness. But as a result, there has been a shift in the decolonial cosmology around the value of life in Palestine or in Gaza. When he visited Palestine in 1973, the French writer Jean Genet perceived a will to live even at the cost of life itself. One of the organizers of Gaza's Great March of Return in 2018 that continues, Ahmad Abu Ratema, sees it differently. And he writes, nothing about life in Gaza is normal. The Nakba is an ongoing reality. And while we can reconcile that we all must eventually die, in Gaza the tragedy is that we don't get to live. The Great March of Return is the resulting change in resistance format. It's what you might call an organized spontaneity. There are no party flags, there's no directive to protesters, there's no use of weapons. Popular assemblies were held in the boundary zone between the city and the fence using a set of hybrid organizational structures that were explicitly modeled on the self-reliant liberation of the 1976 Soweto Youth Uprising in South Africa. So the march embodies consent to see individual life as expendable in the service of life. Now it is that capacity that many in the West find so alien and strange. For some then, these actions show monsters, inhuman in their failure to attend to the primacy of the individual. But how does one become an individual, whether a rational economic actor or a biopolitical data point if you don't get to live. The challenge the march represents has brought together a peculiar alliance of Israel, Qatar, and Hamas to stifle it, an endeavor whose outcome is still unclear. But let's go back to the beginning, the massacre in Gaza on the day that the US opened its embassy in Jerusalem in May of 2018, counted 60 dead and at least 2,700 wounded. The numbers now are about 190 dead, over 19,000 wounded, require 43 million in medical care, of which over half is lacking. 
And the photographs that came out from photojournalists are astonishing, they're appalling, they're apocalyptic. Many say they have no words. The spectacular violence is designed to silence. Far from being concerned that this data might damage their reputation, the occupation sees it as a weapon in his campaign to create a barely lived hopelessness. State violence is specifically intended to suppress speech, even intellect. So we should refuse that intent. We should gather ourselves and refuse not to speak. But the photographs cannot be silent. Even if we don't look at them, they demand to be heard. And I'm gonna speak specifically, briefly, about two astonishing photographs taken by the accomplished Palestinian photojournalist, Wissam Nassar. This is a piece of his from 2014. He faces forward. His work has been a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize. He's worked for the New York Times, Deutsche Press Agentur. He's actively aware of mainstream global image standards, and he writes, I have never worked for Hamas or Fatah. I work for international agencies and magazines. I respect their laws on the objectiveness of photojournalism, some of which, of course, come from his device, because a professional standard camera achieves this depth of field and saturation of color that, of course, we can't actually see, because it doesn't exist as such. It's a calculation, a data set, commensurable with what there is to be seen, but not equivalent to it. And that's why these formulations matter. The intersection of data with action produces something new. So if you take this picture, the man called Saber Al-Ashkar, it was taken in May 11th, 2018, and the photograph was at first received as his memorial because he was reported killed by the Israeli occupation forces, a new catastrophe. But in even more astonishing and unfathomable circumstances, it later turned out that the person killed was a man called Fadi Abu Salah, who's another 29-year-old double amputee, also photographed on the march, who was killed that day. Earlier, Sabah al who I'm showing you here, spoke to a Palestinian blog, quote, I am a double amputee, but I will go back to my grandfather's house sooner or later. It's only a couple of miles from Gaza, end quote. That is true for many Gazan refugees that where they were displaced is almost within sight of where they now are behind the fences. In the second photograph taken by Nassar, he captures a young androgynous figure counterbalancing their crutch and a slingshot. The head covering uses Palestinian covers colors, excuse me, it may be a scarf, it might be a flag, protested into service to protect against the heat, the smoke, and the tear gas. What stands out is the intensity with which these two bodies are articulating their task. Concentration, focus, and coordination in the service of political work. It's likely that they're both targeting one of the drones used to deliver US-made tear gas. Form expressing meaning in space. These are, if you like, history paintings for the time of catastrophe, the Nakba, that has not ceased since 1948. Now, most photojournalists, as I showed you an example a moment ago, waited until the occupation fired tear gas and took pictures of marchers running away toward them. NASA's photographs face forward. The activists themselves refused to perform being disabled despite obviously al having lost his legs, the young person using a crutch. They depict in full the ways in which the occupation's claim to the right to maim Palestinians does not destroy them. Creating debility is part of the asphyxiation of Gaza. You can see the numbers here. The occupation targets the lower limbs. Just so, Fanon noted the prevalence of amputees in revolutionary Algeria, and it was the same in Ireland, where it was known as kneecapping. For Poir, under colonialism, no one is able-bodied. Nevertheless, Fanon says, with all my strength, I refuse to accept that amputation. Far from debility, these Gazans exude capacity, the capacity to decolonize, reminding us that disability is a socially produced condition, not an embodied one. In NASA's photo of Alaska, it's clear why he would have wanted to be close to the ground. He's reached the barbed wire. 
that he would have been a target for the snipers that killed 60 other people that day. Nasser's work opens a different matrix. These are not the Palestinians those of us living outside the reason, region usually see. Now, it's standard critical vocabulary to say that photography depicts the past. In certain moments, the photography created by networked data can also open the way to seeing, excuse me, seeing a different kind of future. Sometimes that future seems full of possibility. In NASA's photographs, it's glimpsed only through the narrow crack in coloniality afforded by undefeated despair, but it becomes something to remember. These photographs show the reappearance of people said to be without history in a devisualized space of history where the refusal of the great man allows the human to appear in a different form. In so doing, they overcome the kinesthetics of colonialism. Reduced to a permanent condition of waiting, the colonized are both halted in physical movement and accelerated in terms of anxiety and depression. But as Fanon saw in revolutionary action, all those men and women who fluctuate between madness and sanity, madness and suicide, excuse me, are restored to sanity, return to action, and take their vital place in the Great March, end of quote. That march was Algeria in 1961. It was in Lacandon with the Zapatistas in 1994, in Tahrir in 2011. It's in Gaza now, the great march of return to escape madness, the flows of depression and self-killing, to reclaim a decolonial reason, to find a space to live. This then is the capacity to decolonize of the dispossessed and the global majority. Now to conclude, although these professional captures and mediating acts are so striking, I do not think they will ultimately be the most important in terms of political action. What sustains the possibility of decolonization are vernacular and performative acts, and these are often shared in low resolution social media, at assemblies, in poetry, and in conversation. If one person came to be associated with the Great March of Return, it was perhaps the medical volunteer, Razan al najjar in the center of the photograph here. At 20, she was older than the average Gazan with a clear sense of what the message of the march was to be. Quote, without weapons, we can do anything. In an interview with the New York Times, al najjar spoke up for Palestinian women, even as she was wearing the headscarf. She says, we have more strength than any man. The strength I showed as a first responder on the first day of the protests, I dare you to find it in anyone else. But on June the 1st, 2018, she was shot. Close to the Gazan fence, she died immediately. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, issued a statement, quote, whatever comes close to the fence are rioters. That's a violent threat. Not whomever, whatever. The rioter, whether here in New York or there in Gaza, claims space. The state reads the riot act and renders them vulnerable, killable, but not grievable. The Gazan artist, Mohamed Tuta, who is himself an amputee, created a memorial for Razan al-Najjar on the beach, photographed here by Marie Bashir, and I saw this on Twitter. And he writes on the sand, Razan Mata, prefaced with a hashtag. The memorial is completed with her photograph and a Palestinian flag. The tide will have erased this memorial within hours, just as a hashtag briefly rides the wave of social media trends and falls out of sight. To become a hashtag in US vernacular means, of course, to suffer a violent death. Tutas Memorial knows from the outset there will be no bronze or marble statue for those killed during the Great March of Return within any foreseeable future. As Fanon understood, the moment to make the future present is very brief and very often betrayed. It is nonetheless as the South African student activist Sandini Nodelu says, an act worth rioting and writing at once. For the possibility of remembering a decolonized, devisualized future keeps coming back. I would urge you to remember that in moments of depression and despair that many of us feel in the present and hope to remember a different kind of future. <laughs>